I'm just gonna hold my guitar like an idiot because I don't wanna move my camera. <laughs> Hey everyone, before we get going today, I just wanted to say super quickly that I am still available for Skype lessons. So if you want to do any kind of individual training with me, please shoot me an email. You can do that by going to my website, LessonsWithMarcel.com. There's a tab called Skype Lessons. You click on that, you should be able to contact me. So uh, hopefully I hear from you soon and then we can make that happen. But let's get on to what we're doing today. So today I thought we could talk about improvising over bluegrass tunes that have faster chord progressions. In a lot of tunes you might have a moment where the chords change every beat or almost every beat assuming you're playing 16th notes or 8th notes depending on how you're counting. I know this is kind of a, a point of tension for bluegrass musicians. I don't I don't know why. That means you can have as little as four notes for every chord. That can be a tough scenario to tackle. So rather than give you a bunch of made up rules or whatever, I am going to slow motion improvise some lines with you, aka compose. I'm gonna do that with the help of my computer and some tab software. Thank you, Power Tab. But before we do that, I'm gonna do a quick recap of some things I've talked about before just so we can make sure that we're all on the same page. All right, so first of all, we need to know what tune we're working on. So I'm gonna pick uh, Bill Cheatham because I know it has some fast moving chords in the B section. Yeah, let's talk about how it's normally played. So normally that piece of melody is tackled in like three different ways. Here are the different ways you could probably play that melody. All right, so you could play the melody with cross picking. Um, there's kind of this fake cross picking that people do just to make it a little easier. And then there's a bass run that a lot of people do, and it's basically the first, second, third, and fifth of every chord. Right, so that's how that tune is played, but we're gonna be improvising over this tune, and hopefully we'll be creating something that works equally well over these chords. So the chords that traditionally accompany this piece of melody are G, C, D, and then back to G. So if you watched my video on using seventh chords, dominant seventh chords, then you know that there's already a way we can spice up this chord progression. We could do G7 to C, then D7 back to G major. Also, because we're already using a bunch of dominant chords, I might just throw in C, uh, C7 instead of C, because we're kind of approaching that point where it's not about what would functionally make sense. We're approaching the blues where just all the chords are dominant anyway, which is kind of a, a different way of looking at chord functions. So now that we know how the tune is normally played and we know what chords work and how we can extend those chords, we want to think about what scales we can use over every chord or just what kind of notes would work better. Now if you watched my video on what scale should I use for bluegrass, this will be a little bit of a recap for you, but I'm just going to blast through it. So basically we need to take all these chords and we need to uh, figure out what notes are in the chord. So if we took G7, we know that we already have G, B, D, and F in that chord. So those those four notes are great. So that means we only need one more note to create a pentatonic scale. Um, let's keep going. If we had a C chord, we would have C, E, G, and A or B flat, depending on if we were creating a, um, right, a C6 arpeggio or a C dominant 7 arpeggio. Not going to get into the specifics of that. And then if we had a D7, of course, we would have a D, F sharp, an A, and a C, which would be our seventh. That means for each one of those, we only need one more note to make it a pentatonic scale. And for every single one of those, I'm going to pick the second interval, the second or ninth but I'm not going to get into that right now. That means my completed little palette for every chord would be G, A, B, D, and F natural for my G7. For my C or C7, I would have C, D, E, G, and then A or B flat. And then for my D7 chord, I would have D, E, F sharp, A, and C natural. Those would be my pentatonic scales for every chord. All right, so now that we have the melody, we have the chords, and we have the scales, it's great if we can have some convention in there just to sprinkle on there and make it all stick together. And what I mean by that is basically just bluegrass vocab, things that happen a lot in bluegrass. I'm just gonna give you two things. There are two things that I've talked about before and two things that come up a lot. The first one is something I call the dirty third, and that's taking a minor third into a major third. So whenever we have the third of a chord, for instance, if we're over a G chord, we could grab that B note. Um, we could slide from B flat into B natural, and that will always feel good kind of pointing out what the third is and where it's going. The other thing that's always good you can do is to point out the dominant seventh over a seventh chord. So um, you can do that by walking down from the root to the seventh. So for instance, if we were over a G7 chord, we could walk from G to F sharp to F natural, which would be the dominant seventh. We could do that over any chord. So those are just our two little pieces of vocab that we're gonna try to use later in our composing. Recap over, let's do some improv. 
All right, so starting from here, we do have some choices to make. I think I'm going to try to start out on every single main note of that G chord. So on my first, my third, and my fifth. And uh, let's try to make a line out of that. The first one I'm going to do, I guess I'm going to start on my fifth, just because I think that's fun. Here we go. So this would be the fifth of my G chord right here. Now I'm only going to have four notes over this chord. Just like when we cross-picked the melody, we had one, two, three, four. And we get to pick four notes that work over this. We can use a lot of things, right? We could point out the seventh. We can also do our move with the third. Um, we could just do an arpeggio. There's lots of different ways that we can make this melody go. But um, I'm going to pick this, I think. One, two, three, four. All right, so I went from my fifth down to my third, and then I did my dirty third motion. Now the nice thing about this is I've actually set myself up for the change. I'm on a B note. The next chord I have to play over is a C chord. So I get to put a lot of stress on that motion. Right? I created a leading tone. Right, so it's kind of nice if you can make the last note of however much time you have create a leading motion into the next chord. So this is definitely the note that I'm going to start over on my C chord. So that's going to be 5th fret on my G string. I'm going to write that down real quick. And then, um, oh, what do I want to do? I think um, I think I'm going to point out the 7 over this chord. I said I might do that if I was feeling saucy. And I am, so here we go. I could do something like that. The next chord I have to play over is a D chord. And once again, I've set myself up. So I'll start from the beginning here. Dirty third leads into my C chord. C chord points out the dominant seventh of C. I end up on this G note, which is the fifth of C. And the next chord is D, which has an F sharp, which is right below that G. So once again, I only have a half step to move to the next chord. Yeah, I'm gonna do that. So uh, once again, I'm playing off of the dirty third, then I go up to the fifth of D, and then I'm resolving it to my open G string. So the line I just made sounds like this. Definitely the polarizing thing about that line is definitely going to be about whether or not you actually want to imply C7 right there. I guess you could make this lick so that way it doesn't sit on that too hard. Hey, and if you like that, more power to you. Let's start another line, and let's pick a different note of the G chord to start on. Yeah, so I started the last one on the fifth. I guess I'm going to start this one on the third. So I don't want to use that dirty third thing right away because I already used that. I think what would be fun is if I played the third to start, and for my next three notes, if I walk down to the seventh of the G chord. Because that's where I'm going to land for that C chord. I think that's how I'm going to start. Those are going to be my first four notes. That's why I picked them. So as I said before, I'm starting my next line on the third of the C chord, right there. Now, coming all the way back to this note, you can see I'm, I'm real close to kind of that bluegrass easy spot back there in first position. I don't think I'm going to hang out there, though. I think I'd rather stay closed because it's dangerous. I think I like that. It doesn't use the third, it doesn't point out the seventh, it doesn't do any of the tricks, it's just notes in the chord. And so, sometimes that works great, sometimes you don't need anything more than that. So I'm going to do that. Also those notes, they're the same notes that would be played in the melody if you were cross-picking it. So maybe that's why I like them. Cool, my line up to this point is... I'd rather do something more exciting over the D chord because um, I have the opportunity to. So let's see here. That's going to be the note that I start my D line on. Yeah, I like that. So I'm jumping down to the root of the D chord. Then I'm sliding into the third, which walks me all the way up chromatically back to the root of the G chord to end. My second line now sounds like this. I like that. So, yeah. All right, cool. Let's do uh, the last one of these, which means that I have to start on the root of the G chord. I didn't want to do this initially just because the, the kind of bass runway of playing this melody starts on the root. 
Um, and I really don't want to repeat that. I want to find a different thing to do. Yeah, I'll start on this, um, actually my open G string. Once again, starting on that open G string, I'm going to walk up on my G string. How about zero, two, three? So that way I hit that seventh. My next note is going to have to be over the C chord. So I want to hit the third of the C chord. So that's going to be my second fret on my D string. Um, that means I have. I do like this move. I think I already used it in this tune. Maybe I didn't use it exactly like that. Maybe I will use it. And uh, from right here, I'm on a G note. You know, we we'll always want to end these lines so that we have some kind of leading tone. Um, the closest note I can grab in the D chord would maybe be my F sharp, or it could be that A. The F sharp is closer, but it might be a little awkward to go down. Let's try it. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a cool note to pick. That would be the obvious choice, but once again, I already ended a line like that. I think I'm going to do that. I'm going to slide into that third to the dirty third right away. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to return to the third too. So my third line ends up being... Which is nice. That's uh, that's great. Let's try just just a small little snippet of maybe another tune that would be um, fun. Um, you know what, what comes to mind is uh, Beaumont Rag uh, because you really don't have a lot of time over those chords. Um, so the chords are F to F sharp diminished to C to A7 and D7 G7 C. So up to speed, it would sound like here we go. song we start over. Yeah, let's uh, try to create a line over that. It's going to be uh, probably a lot harder, but a lot of fun too. So our first chord is F. We're going to have four notes over F. That means we're right uh, up here if we want to start up the neck a little bit, and I think I do. So I'm going to... <laughs> That's already my four notes. Yeah, I'm going to stick with that though. My next chord is going to be that F sharp diminished. That's convenient. So it is right there. Um, it's almost like going from that F to that F7 right there, right? Um, so I'm going to go... I'm going to use a little bit of phrasing too. Once again, I'm feeling saucy. So I'm going to put a quarter note right there. So that's... C to A7. Which works, right? So this would be over my C chord. And then over my A chord, that would be the third. This is good. It's fun when you uh, kind of make choices quickly and you force yourself to say yes to the situation and then you got to roll with it. So that means to wrap this up, I need to get something for D, G7, and then I'm home free. I, I think I'm going to uh, I think I'm gonna end it in a jazzy way. Uh, hope, hopefully no one gets mad at me. But uh, a lot of times it's common in these bebop lines to uh, end something with a sixth or to, um, to, to put a sixth in the middle of a line. So you get lines like this. I think I'm going to end my line like that in this case. So I don't have the line written yet, but I think that's what I'm going to put at the end. So I think I'm going to do that from my D7 chord, I guess. A little bland. So one, two, three, four. So that little line I just wrote for Beaumont Rag sounds like this. Alright, so I hope you got something out of watching me think through these problems a little bit. I'm going to just recap some good practices, you know, but... First of all, 
when you find the tune, make sure you know the tune, make sure you know the common ways it's already played, um, then make sure you know the chords, make sure you know how to add alterations to those chords if you're going to add dominant tones and stuff like that. It's just going to give you a bigger palette to play with when you go to do your improvisations. And then after that, of course, you can turn those things into scales and you can you know, build that palette however you want it to be. If you're playing a different genre, you might pick different notes. Of course, you would want to know the convention of the genre you're playing. We were playing bluegrass, so I gave you that little dirty third trick and that dominant seventh. Make sure that as you move from chord to chord, you're picking close notes to transition, right? I did that in a bunch of different ways, but you know, for instance, if you're moving from your G chord to your C chord, the third of the G chord is a B note, and the root of the C chord is a C note. So B and C are right next to each other. They would be a good place to put in the last slot and in the first slot of those measures. So that way you could have that beautiful transition. Um, what you want to avoid is, as each chord changes, you don't want to like start over the position, start from the root note again every time. No, you want to make it almost feel you know seamless. The transitions want to be real nice and smooth, and they want to be neighborly. You don't want those big jumps. So those are probably all the things that you should make sure that you're looking after and trying to get into your playing. Um, anyway, moving on. If you like taking a lesson from the biggest, baddest Billy Goat in the barnyard, there's a couple things you can do for me. I would love it if you would give this video a like or leave me a comment down there. I love hearing from you guys. You can also subscribe to this channel. There's three big places you can find me besides here. That's Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. On Instagram, I also run a daily lick account. And that's with my buddy Lyman Lipke. We have a podcast to go with that as well. Um, but we post a new lick every single day and we post two licks on Friday. That's tons of content. Um, of course, you can always sign up for Skype lessons on my website as well. That's lessonswithmarcel.com. Bunch of free stuff on there. A little bit of stuff you can download. I think that's everything. Man, it feels like so much to get through every time. I guess I'll see you next Wednesday. Bye.